Hugh Hefner's deeply Christian mother, Grace, was asked if she was proud of him. She said yes, but she wished he had been a missionary. Hefner said, but mum, I was. He was quite serious. Time magazine said he spread the gospel of pleasure with a dogged devotion that would do credit to any missionary. And his creed was personal liberation, sexual freedom, and material abundance. As Pope of America's sexual revolution for over 60 years, he was very clear about its threat to religion. The traditional Judeo-Christian concept of sexual morality is not working, he said. And brandishing Alfred Kinsey's research, which was life-changing for him, he warned clergy, unless you are willing to begin making suggestions for the establishment of a new, enlightened contemporary morality that works, people will look elsewhere for their answers. He had a point. Not a few commentators have observed that the sexual revolution and secularization went hand in hand in Western countries. Many people found pleasure in the playboy values which were endorsed now by experts. And so biblical values seemed prudish and plain wrong, casting doubt over the Bible and even God. And if there was no God, the logic went, then pleasure in this life may be all the meaning we ever have. Hefner found some religion guilty of being anti-sexual, but he aimed to divide and conquer by publicizing liberated elements and criticizing only people in religion that continues to deny man's sexual nature and pits man's body and soul against one another. He said most churches had adjusted their doctrines to fit Darwin's theory, so they should now adapt to Freud's. I'll aim to sketch Hefner's missionary efforts using, firstly, the publishing power of his best-selling magazine, and secondly, his own life story, which he deliberately crafted as an apologetic. I'll sketch a critique of the life and teachings of Hugh, using accounts which challenge the carefully constructed media image. And I'll suggest that social science data now raise serious questions about the effects of his sexual revolution. And just a content warning, I find some of this material sad and confronting, and I encourage you to switch off or talk to someone if you need to. So first of all, what was in Playboy magazine? Obviously, Hefner published pornography. It was mild compared with what your child sees today in the mall, let alone the extremes of porn. But it was the first step. Previous under-the-counter magazines showed grainy photos of jaded sex workers, but Hefner the ad man gave porn the glossy, full-color treatment of upmarket products. And he used the fresh, wholesome girl next door, saying, potential playmates are all around you, the new secretary at your office, the girl who sells you shirts. He said the centerfold in its own way was as much a statement of the sexual revolution as the playboy philosophy. Looking back, we now know much more about what pornography does. It's highly addictive, causing neural change in the brain. It can decrease trust and admiration for a partner's personality, looks, and lovemaking. It can decrease intimacy and trust in a relationship and increase an individual's loneliness and apathy, blurring their life purpose. It can increase tolerance for rape and sadomasochism and sexual violence, which is now so common in mainstream porn. And it can drive a broader moral relativism, which is, in Alfred Moller's phrase, not normally a philosophical decision, but a pelvic one. Spiritually, as Samuel James says, pornography is arguably the single greatest secularizing force in culture. And Hefner, a cartoonist himself, personally supervised every cartoon in Playboy. And so we see the old pastor praying God will forgive the little girl he's just abused. We see hypocritical, greedy clergy, a God who is distant and imperfect, silly Bible stories, though Jesus isn't satirized, perhaps to avoid backlash. We see the devil throwing great parties with gorgeous women and people wanting to defect from heaven to hell. We see Puritans, America's first Christians, as sexless and voyeuristic and racist hypocrites. The facts didn't matter as long as the myth was perceived as real. And Daniel Gunn says Playboy cartoons wielded soft power, a gentle and subtle approach to undermine confidence in Christianity and Christians today. But it also contained child images. In 1985, Dr. Judith Reisman blew the whistle on this. She found children's images associated with nudity, genital activity, sexual association with adults, and force. And the child was almost always depicted as unharmed or even benefited. 
The timing was terrible for Hefner. First, his Playmate of the Year 1980, Dorothy Stratton, had been found murdered by her pimp ex-husband, and serious writers blamed the Playboy system for exploiting her. Hefner said, the way I'm perceived by others is one of the most important things in my life, and this threatens what I'm all about. He was obsessed with defending himself and counter-attacking, which only stirred up more publicity and legal action, and kept the matter in people's minds for five years. With all the pressure, Hefner had a stroke in 1985, at age 58. Secondly, porn was being attacked from left and right, since radical feminists were agreeing with conservative Christians. An ad campaign accused Playboy of promoting low commitment sex, recreational drugs, selfish materialism and adolescent irresponsibility, resulting in an epidemic of teenage pregnancies, divorces, venereal diseases, fatherless children and abortions. Many Americans agreed. Third, the best known porn star of the 70s, Linda Lovelace of Deep Throat, had just written her book Ordeal, claiming her pimp husband had beaten her and threatened her with a gun to make her do porn, including a film with a dog. Hefner wanted to see the dog scene, so he flew their dog Rufus up from Florida and kept it at the mansion where they were now gold card guests. He told them he'd found it difficult getting a dog to perform with a 17-year-old girl. Hefner, of course, denied Linda's story, saying he was just doing old friends a favour by looking after the animal while they searched for a house. But years later, Holly Madison found an old reel stashed away in a drawer full of porn labelled Girl and Dog. Fourth, a new disease called AIDS was reaching crisis point, driving a new sexual conservatism. And fifth, Ronald Reagan had read the moment and won votes from the moral majority, started by the Reverend Jerry Falwell, to lobby for family values. Reagan said porn was a form of pollution and a public problem and announced an Attorney General's inquiry into it. When Reisman's findings made the news, Falwell and others called for a boycott on 7-Eleven stores for selling porn. Some 10,000 stores stopped selling Playboy. Hefner counterattacked, claiming conservatives wanted to go back to the 50s and restrict people's freedoms. He ran a nude pictorial called The Girls of the Moral Majority. Playboy successfully sued the Attorney General and ran another nude pictorial, The Women of 7-Eleven. Playboy asserted it had never portrayed children sexually and never would. And it led a PR campaign against Reisman, who was attacked in the press and disowned by academics, suffering the usual corporate PR attack on the whistleblower. Think Jeffrey Widenant with Big Tobacco. Playboy said Reisman had been a musician on children's TV, not mentioning her PhD on media effects. It painted her as a conservative, not mentioning that she grew up attending American Communist Party meetings. When Dr. Reisman died last month, she was pilloried for some other fringe theories and harsh statements against homosexual activists, but her main findings were ignored. No one seems to want to check her claims. So I sourced some of the old playboys she cites. I cannot vouch for all her study and I won't even describe the images, but the ones I checked showed Reisman was correct. And one Playboy article, Kids Stuff from 1976, says, the big news is that there is a lot more direct eroticism flowing through a child's small body than most adults are willing to acknowledge. Reisman said Playboy was a source of sex education for many of its 15 million readers and could be breaking down inhibitions about the sexual exploitation of children and trivialising it with humour. She asked that porn magazines simply leave children out completely until further study could be done. She was mocked, but the images quietly stopped. Reisman had also outed Hefner's hero, the global pioneer of sex research, Alfred Kinsey, as using pedophiles' experiences to research sexual responses of children and infants. It's there in his first book, Tables 30 to 34, on pre-adolescent orgasm. Reisman exposed this at an academic conference and was stunned to find most psychologists there defended the great man's research methods. Some professors even presented papers on a children's right to have sex with adults, in line with the views of Sigmund Freud and Wilhelm Reich. These facts are rarely mentioned today, although the Yorkshire television documentary Kinsey's Pedophiles explores them. It seems clear that there was a strong push to normalise child sex in the 70s, and Hefner did not oppose it. 
But what about the print journalism and interviews? The person most interviewed in Playboy was a young church secretary. Jessica Hahn had been drugged and raped by the Reverend Jim Baker, whose top-rating TV ministry earned $129 million a year. She was a virgin and said it hurt like hell. She kept quiet, not wanting to damage the church, and was also paid. But Baker's enemy leaked the story, creating a major scandal. Hahn's Playboy interview said she had $40 in a bank and was feeling suicidal on her 28th birthday and prayed to God for a sign. The next day, Playboy called. She posed for a pictorial, moved into the Playboy mansion. She said Hefner was her church and protected her. He promised that I wouldn't have to do anything I didn't want to do. No sexual favors, although I did sleep with him. Hahn was paid a million dollars for her first shoot, way over the usual fee. And she said, those guys, they never took advantage of me. But whether Hahn saw the bigger picture or not, Hefner used her story to full advantage. Hahn was interviewed three times and did three nude pictorials in Playboy, keeping the scandal story running. The master spin doctor got full value from his million. He looked kinder, more Christian than the preachers, especially when Tammy Baker told reporters she felt better when she saw that Jessica Hahn was ugly. Jessica said she really felt ugly until she saw herself in Playboy and realized God had created her beautiful. So clearly God smiled on Playboy. These televangelist scandals, also called Pearlygate or Repent House, severely damaged the reputation of Christianity and they were PR gold for Hefner. And then he wrote the Playboy philosophy. When Playboy was so profitable that Hefner could replace his convertible with a chauffeured Mercedes flying bunny flags, he wanted to be taken seriously as a philosopher on sex. He wanted a movie about himself with a final court scene showing the evils of censorship. Columbia developed a playful script, but Hefner wanted serious themes and a six hour movie. The project flopped, so Hefner started writing. In his pajamas, in his round bed, with the curtains drawn, never seeing the sun. He lived on Pepsi and amphetamines, staying up for three or four days at a time, hardly blinking and working around the clock. And he pumped out almost 250,000 words, which really make three points. First, sex was neither evil nor sacred, but normal and healthy and fun, and did not need to involve love. He said religion promoted unhealthy views on sex, giving many examples. Second, religion had too much influence in law. America needed separation of church and state and freedom of speech. In our laws related to sex, he said, we find the greatest church state intrusion upon our personal freedom. And he argued freedom was crucial to American democracy and capitalism, which made it superior to communism. And third, he repeatedly criticized that religious foolishness about man's spirit and body being in conflict with God primarily concerned with the spirit of man and the devil dwelling in his flesh. Most Christians agreed claiming that the soul-good-body-bad dualism of medieval Catholicism had mostly been reconsidered. They countered that Hefner blamed Christianity for ignoring the body, but he ignored soul and spirit, reducing people to less than human. Many readers praised his new moral reasoning, but many saw just a predictable defense of Hefner's own greed and sexual appetites, using half-understood ideas at undergraduate level, long-winded, defensively pompous and breathtakingly naive. One author said Hefner offered a false choice between prudery and recreational seduction, not even considering any medium middle ground like loving sex in a committed relationship. Most clergy ignored him, even though Playboy offered them a 75% discount, and he wanted a reaction. He mailed all clergy and theology teachers nationally a copy of the Playboy philosophy, with a letter claiming a friend had said they might be interested and asking their opinion. Many replied, and most letters made some positive comments. He printed the positive comments out of context in Playboy, often causing serious problems for the writers. But Hefner was overjoyed. Agree or disagree, the church were taking him seriously. He held radio discussions with clergy. Some, like Harvard theologian Harvey Cox, were willing to adapt Christian morality to the times and Hefner paid and publicized him. He did not go near Billy Graham, who preached frankly and convincingly on biblical sexual morality, who had no personal scandals, 
and who showed great charisma and good humour as a media performer, for example, in his classic interview on The Woody Allen Show. In one clergy discussion, Hefner argued that marriages would be happier if people first took time for a sexual sampling of the opposite sex, and he said this was statistically proven by Kinsey's research. The, Episcopal the Episcopalian priest and the rabbi thought he had a point, while the Catholic stayed with the Bible and said premarital sex was wrong. Today, we could easily point to 40 years of research showing that the premarital cohabitation effect actually makes later divorce more likely. The social science contradicts Hefner's claims. But enough about the magazine. What about Hefner's life? He always used his story to advance his beliefs, like a testimony in apologetics. Playboy turned his life into what he called a fantasy perception, and the press played along with headlines like, Playboy's Playboy lives American male's dream. His Playboy mansion became a lifelong promotional stunt, attracting headlines about its rotating bed and orgies with models in its grotto. Hefner was the only corporate CEO in America whose spending on women and parties was tax deductible as a marketing expense. His girlfriend Holly Madison said, there is something Hugh Hefner loves more than sex, and that's fame. Hefner often blamed his Christian upbringing. When reporters asked if it was fair to expect his girlfriends to be faithful while he slept around, he said, I'm afraid I do believe in a double standard for men and women far more than I want to admit. You know, I still have some of the Puritan heritage that I grew up with. Did he really expect us to believe that his Christian parents had taught him that? He often said his Christian family were unaffectionate with absolutely no hugging or kissing and told him nothing about sex, which set him on a course to Playboy and changed my life and the world. He said, I'm still reacting. Sex may have been an awkward topic because his grandfather, James Hefner, went to prison for taking indecent liberties with girls of 10 and 11. Hugh was disgusted, but later he would tell the story in a way that blamed the sexual repression of a conservative society rather than his grandfather. He said the real sinners were people who were trying to make the rules. They were the Puritans. It seems very strange to blame lawmakers for child abuse. And biographer Stephen Watts says Hefner's complaints about his childhood were the product of later life. Hefner also talked about his first marriage in a way that blamed marriage itself. But he'd married Millie, unsure of how well matched they were. He'd been away in the army for most of their courtship, and he tended to live kind of in a fantasy world of imagination so he may not have really known her. And Millie admitted to him that she'd had an affair. Hefner was so shocked he could barely speak. He would forgive Millie and would marry her, but he said, this was the single most devastating experience of my entire life. Nothing was ever the same between us again. He said, the magic had gone from the very beginning. I was totally crushed. How ironic that he then went on to start a magazine devoted to extramarital sex. Typically, he blamed society for rules that forced people into marriage, not Millie's adultery or his dreaminess. A religious journalist asked if Hefner had ever sinned, and he said, oh, sure, but I haven't pursued very much immoral behavior. I'm a pretty moral guy. Morality is what is perceived as good for people, and sin is things that are hurtful to people. He stuck to that line in many interviews. His morals were better and more fun than the mainstream, and he wasn't hurting anyone. Many media outlets repeated this, Hef the good guy. Yet there is a dark side. Without resorting to personal attacks, I submit it is fair to examine his life, at least by his own standards. Did he do anything hurtful to people? Well, Mickey Garcia testified to the US Commission on Pornography in 1985 that Hefner and his staff encouraged playmates to use illegal drugs, coerced them into bisexual activities and orgies to satisfy Hefner's interests. Garcia had been Miss January of 1973 and a director of Playmate Promotions for six years. And she said models had told her about rapes, abuse, drug addiction, attempted suicide and prostitution. She said she had not been to police. It's difficult to get legal representation if they know it involves Hugh Hefner. Playboy simply pff, denied her claims, saying she was attempting to peddle a book about Playboy, which has been rejected by every publisher. But since then, many tell-all books from the Playboy Mansion confirm Garcia's story, suggesting Playboy's PR was a lie. And Hefner clearly had underage girls at the mansion. 
At a sweet 16 party for his own daughter, Hefner took one of her friends to bed. Two women claimed they were sexually assaulted at the Playboy Mansion as minors, both by Hefner's close friend Bill Cosby. One sued Hefner for introducing her to Cosby when he should have known better. Then more than 60 women came forward alleging that they were drugged and raped by Cosby, some as minors. Cosby protested his innocence, but he admitted to giving women the sedative quaaludes, and in 2018 he was found guilty of three charges of aggravated sexual assault. Hefner said he was shocked at these claims. Shocked. Stefan Tatenbaum was Hefner's personal valet, and he said Hefner would hire hugely endowed porn stars and watch them with girls. If the girls couldn't walk, he said, I would have to escort them to the bedrooms so they could recuperate. Hef sometimes gave bonuses because the sex acts were so painful. He was very brutal to his girlfriends and his sex partners. And Tatenbaum also said Hefner filmed everything as blackmail in case someone considered telling his secrets to the media. Aside from these scandals, what did the regular promiscuity of the mansion do to the women involved and to Hefner himself? Well, Hefner wrote, publishing a sophisticated men's magazine seemed the best way of fulfilling a dream to get laid a lot. He said, I have built a perpetual woman machine. And he had. Beautiful young women, hoping to be in Playboy for money and fame, would flock to his mansion, willing to do almost anything. He shared this perpetual woman machine with Hollywood stars who brought him prestige and media titans who gave him favourable coverage and politicians and policemen who protected him. The numbers of women involved were unimaginable and the mansion was just a scene of sexual activity day and night in the 70s. Hefner said, I pick good looking young girls because I get something very good out of the innocence and sweetness. Most of the girls I've gone out with have benefited because I give them an identity. And when they come out of the machine, they're better for it. But if you listen to the girls themselves, they report callous treatment and feeling regret, feeling disposable and insecure. A surprising number of them consider suicide. His official girlfriends often left deeply heartbroken. Take Sondra's Theodore, a Sunday school teacher when Hefner bedded her and she fell in love, building her life around him. Hefner, though, was really committed to non-commitment. And he said she was a special girl, but not the only girl. Sandra tried to accept this. She said, I love him too much to throw it out the window over a silly thing like him seeing another girl once in a while. The others are just adventures. She even went and fetched any other girl he wanted in bed. But it hurt her deeply. She began to cry frequently and turned to alcohol and drugs. Hefner said she was too possessive and emotionally brittle and she left. But she said it was very difficult on me, very difficult, and I had a lot of anger, and I felt betrayed. That basic plot repeats again and again with many more girlfriends who start as young, virginal, fresh-faced Jews or Christians and leave hurt and broken. And what about the girls who just hung around the mansion and were used? One said she slept around and was then pushed into anal sex with Hefner. She said, I felt dirty, disgusted with myself, and after that, nothing seemed to matter much. I began to realize I was completely expendable, no more than a plaything. No one at the mansion wanted to know what kind of person was in my body, what thoughts I had. I could have been a doll. I was such a mess that I tried suicide a couple of times. To me, there was no purpose to the kind of life I was leading. In the end, I went home to Virginia, completely burned out. For a while, I was in a mental hospital and I was under psychotherapy for a long time. But I eventually got over the experience. Playboy magazine should have a warning on it, like cigarette advertising. This philosophy can be dangerous to your health. There are many other stories like this. Some suicides went largely unreported. And in the competitive, insecure mansion environment of beautiful girls with eating disorders and body dysmorphia and drugs, girlfriend Holly Madison contemplated suicide. She felt that Hefner's main concern would be navigating Playboy out of any sort of PR crisis, again promoting the idea that life inside those walls was nothing short of paradise. And just like that, she said, I would be swept under the rug with every other scandal and ghost that once plagued Hugh Hefner. We could ask how the sex was for Hefner himself. He promoted himself as a sexual legend and said the Playboy Mansion was an Eden 
an Eden that prompted pleasure seekers to leave their inhibitions at the gate. But many girlfriends have written tell-all books describing scheduled sex nights, Viagra, drugs and alcohol for the many girls, porn on screens all around the room, girls pretending to make up with each other but actually making fun of it all. Hefner would have sex with a few girls for a minute each, and then the grand finale, Hef masturbated while watching the porn. I never saw him come while having sex with anyone. He always masturbated. Wow. You have to say Hefner used his own product, but here he is surrounded by the most beautiful women money can buy and surgically alter, yet he's unable to focus on any one of them, even just sexually, let alone connecting emotionally or showing affection, let alone intimacy, let alone love. This is the jaded burnout described by porn addicts. When it was all over, he always said a loud, dramatic, God damn it, wow! He always said the same thing, and everyone in the room would silently mimic his words as he said them. So God got a mention every time Hefner orgasmed, alone in the mansion. The God Hefner had ditched decades ago to make his own Eden. Imagine God creating sex for love and connection and exuberant admiration and children and belonging and kin and future and seeing it all just reduced to lonely selfishness. We could also ask how life was for Hefner's children. He admits he was a terrible father in his first marriage. His children went weeks without seeing him, and Millie said he didn't particularly want children. After the divorce, he would see them a few times a year, and this made his daughter Christy very sad because her dad made so little time for her. Hefner said, I pursued my dream and I have no regrets. Some people were made to be parents and some made to do other things. A friend said also that Christie's greatest disappointment was that her father didn't date women his intellectual equal. Hefner said, obviously you're not going to get any real intellectual drive from young girls, but I don't look for the same intellectual stimulation from women as I do from men. Imagine how that made his daughter feel. In his second marriage, as AIDS kept him monogamous, Hefner spent some time playing with his two sons. When the marriage broke up, he moved them all next door and saw them briefly once a week. His ex-wife Kimberly said, my boy's dad is missing out big time. It's his loss. It's such a huge, sad thing. Hef does what Hef wants. But the boys always say to me, mummy, we're planning on having one girlfriend. What can we say in conclusion? Hefner's ethics allowed him to do things that seriously damaged his lovers, his family, and I would suggest himself. This raises serious questions about his ethics. He exposed similar actions by some Christian leaders, but they were acting contrary to their Christian ethics, whereas Hefner's actions were consistent with his ethics. Hefner said he believed in morality and laws that are based upon logic and reason rather than mysticism and religious dogma. As a Christian, I agree that morals should consider reason and research. But from what I can see, 60 years of research data is raising serious questions about the effects of sexual revolution values like premarital sex, extramarital sex, on-demand abortion, no-fault divorce, and pornography. Christians such as Glyn Harrison, Mary Eberstadt, Mark Regnerus, Helen Alvare, Jennifer Roback Morse, Gabrielle Kuby, and Ryan T. Anderson deploy social science in making the case for Christian sexual ethics and aiming to tell what Harrison calls a better story, describing a more compelling vision of human flourishing as the loving God of the Bible intended for his children.